Hello and welcome to the fourth lecture of the surgical sessions. Um, this is by Mind the Bleep. We are four uh, junior doctors, FY2 doctors, who have set up this surgical sessions lecture series to try to give out information to um, medical students and junior doctors on how to manage common surgical presentations on the wards. Um, this lecture is on colorectal polyps and colorectal cancer. Um, we are, as mentioned, junior doctors, and we aim to give you this information um, as part of a full lecture series on surgery, and it's to be used um, in sort of the light of you being a, a surgical um, on-take doctor and what you might see on the ward and how to manage the common surgical presentations. We won't go into loads of pathophysiology or loads of anatomy, but mostly what's uh, relevant for you and what you'll uh, need to know to be able to manage the common surgical presentations. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us on webinars at mindthebleep.com. We'll answer all your questions there. Um, or then um, also you can comment on the uh, Facebook comment below. So the general format of um, these sessions is going through the uh, examination and the clerking that's important for your, um, your surgical uh, on-take um, examination and investigations of the patients. We want to go through brief anatomy and patho pathology and pathophysiology of the di different diseases you might see and the etiology. Then we want to go through the investigations that you will be expected to order yourself um, and the investigations you'll be asked to order by your seniors um, and why you might be asked to order those. Then we'll go through some complications you might see on the wards and then we'll have some questions along the way as well to try and make it interactive. So just briefly on me, uh, my name is Freya. I'm one of the FY2 doctors running the surgical series. Uh, my interests are in plastics, maxfax and medical education. So for this, um, in this lecture, the key learning points is understanding the uh, relevant anatomy of the large bowel, um, understanding the common presentations of colorectal cancer, the symptoms you might see both in an outpatient setting and on the wards, and identifying common emergency presentations, as well as understanding the risk factors of which patients you might be seeing on the wards. So just going through the case and going through the lecture, just think that you're the surgical FY1 on take when you um, see some of these presentations and the cases. So we've um, heard your feedback that you want these lectures to be a bit more interactive. So we've tried to um, incorporate some questions along the way that you are able to answer by using uh, Poll Everywhere. So if you have a different device, log in on your computer, you go to pollev.com slash mindthebleep519 and the questions should come up along the way. And um, so this is a, a trial, so just bear with us if it's a bit slow to work. So let's start with our case. So you are the surgical FY1 on take. Um, <clears throat> Just going back. So the link here is poll everywhere, pollev.com slash mind the bleep 519. So if you just open that on a different screen or on your phone, you should be able to um, follow, follow the, um, the web page and follow the questions along the way. I'll just leave that up for a few seconds so you can write it down. Right, so back to our case. So you're the surgical FY1 on take when you are asked to see a 71 year old male who presents with 10 days of constipation. He tells you that his abdomen has recently become distended and it's now quite uncomfortable. So, first time you're seeing this patient, what are your key surgical questions? So he's told you he has abdominal pain, do you want to go through your Socrates? This is quite a foolproof way of clerking a patient with abdominal pain. So where is it? Is it localised or is it um, generalised pain? 
When did it start? Was it sudden in onset or was it gradual? What sort of pain is it? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Important to differentiate between colicky pain and um, uh, constant pain. Does it radiate anywhere? Does it radiate down to the thighs uh, or up to the chest? Um, or does it follow the classic uh, loin to groin appearance that you might see in urological presentations? Does it have any associated symptoms such as nausea and vomiting, um, rectal bleeding? Um, and does the pain change with, with the time of day? So is it worse when he eats? Is it worse in the morning? Or does he get night pain, which is quite a sinister sign? Um, does anything alleviate or exacerbate the pain? Does it get worse with food, or worse with opening their bowels? And then you can ask them how severe it is on the classic scale of zero to 10. When you're met with this patient with constipation, you want to differentiate between constipation and obstipation. So constipation is um, essentially a difficulty passing bowel motions and it can be partial where they pass some motions, or they have a difficulty passing um, not opening their bowels, but they do pass some, or complete constipation, also called obstipation. So this is when they're not passing any fe uh, feces at all, and they're not passing gas either. Then you want to establish what their regular bowel habit is. So what's, um, what, how many times a week do they go? what's normal for them. Some people go three times a day, some people go three times a week. Generally, we say that anything less than three times a week is fairly unusual and can be classed as constipation. What's the quality of their bowels? Has it changed um, in caliber, which is important in some um, rectal disorders and uh, colorectal disorders, you might see a um, sort of smaller caliber of stool, which might indicate a stricture um, or a smaller bowel lumen. Um, have they noticed any diarrhea? And then ask about blood. So have they noticed any fresh PR bleeding? Uh, is the blood, uh, what, what volume is the blood? Is their blood only on the paper? Um, is it associated with pain on opening their bowels? Or is the blood mixed in with the stool? You can ask them about melina as well. Um, a lot of patients um, aren't familiar with the concept of melina and it's then best to sort of describe it and say it's Notice that your stools are black, tar-like and foul-smelling. Then you want to ask about tenesmus. Um, do they feel like um, an ink, that they have an incomplete um, opening of their, um, of their bowels when they go? <clears throat> right, so then you want to ask about constitutional symptoms. Have they noticed any weight loss? any fatigue, any fevers, how long have they been noticing this for, uh, how much weight loss have they noticed, or have they just noticed that um, the, their clothes have become a bit more baggy, um, that they don't have the same exercise tolerance as before. Then you want to ask about past medical history. Do they have a past medical history of inflammatory bowel disease? So this is important. Uh, ulcerative colitis in particular increases your risk of colorectal surgery um, a lot. Diabetes is important to ask about because of their pre-morbid state. That goes for cardiac and respiratory disease as well. So if this patient is surgical and they'll need an operation, you have to establish what their performance status is. Do they have any comorbidities? That means um, surgery is going to be difficult, anesthesia is going to be difficult to so establish all their past medical history and what, what drugs they're taking as well. Important also to ask about any previous surgery. Are they at risk of um, surgical adhesions? And that could be a cause of obstruction um, underlying their constipation. Ask about family history. Do they have any family history of malignancy, in particular colorectal cancer? and any family history of autoimmunity, um, including inflammatory bowel disease, but also the other autoimmune disorders such as thyroid disorder and type one diabetes, as they, these do increase the risk of, of um, autoimmune dis disorders such as IBD as well. 
Ask them about smoking and alcohol. Always get a, a full smoking history. It increases the risk massively of colorectal cancer, as does alcohol. Ask them about um, units they drink every day. Assess whether the patient is obese. Obesity is another big risk factor for colorectal cancer. So going back to our case, we have our 71 year old patient who's presenting with 10 days of constipation and abdominal discomfort. He also tells you that he's vomited three times starting today, uh, mainly gastric contents was the last time, it didn't really bring up much. He's also experiencing colicky abdominal pain for five days. He's not noticed any melina or fresh PR bleeding, but he's been unable to pass flaters for the past five days, so complete constipation for five days. This also tells, also tells you he's noticed eight kilos of weight loss over the past three months. He has a past medical history of type two diabetes controlled with metformin. So let's just touch on the differential diagnosis of constipation. So constipation is very common, a common presentation, especially in the outpatient setting. Um, it's usually idiopathic and it's often age related. So in older age, um, patients may not move as much, mobilize as much, their diet might be poorer, but also just being at older age, your bowel motility worsens and therefore patients often experience idiopathic constipation. However, const new constipation in an older patient should never be diagnosed as idiopathic unless it's been um, investigated properly because it is one of the red flag symptoms. So the other differentials are colorectal cancer. Hypercalcemia can cause um, constipation. So make sure you investigate their electrolytes and any underlying causes of hypercalcemia, such as bone disease. And then thyroid disorder. Although with thyroid disorder, especially hypothyroidism, you would expect weight gain rather than weight loss. So as mentioned, constipation, new constipation in the elderly is a red flag symptom for colorectal cancer. The other red flag symptoms are any change in bowel habit, new diarrhea, abdominal pain, rectal bleeding, and iron deficiency anemia. And it's important to note here that iron deficiency anemia is not a diagnosis, but a symptom that has to be investigated. So you go on to examine your patient after your history taking. You can do, if the patient's stable, do a brief A to E, measure their observations, make sure they're afebrile and hemodynamically stable. Then do a full abdominal examination, examine all the quadrants for masses, examine the distension, whether it's fluid filled or whether it's tympanic on percussion, and then assess for any organ amegaly, especially assess the liver edge. The non-tender bulky liver edge is uh, quite a sinister sign and indicates with a liver primary cancer or liver metastasis. You want to check for peripheral lymphadenopathy in anyone with weight loss and any signs of anemia, so conjunctival pallor, colonicia, and angular colitis. And you always want to do a digital rectal exam, assess whether you can feel any masses on, on your PR exam or whether you can see any blood on the stool or whether the rectum is empty uh, or impacted. Then due to this patient presenting with constipation, you also want to examine the external hernial orifices to see whether they have any incarcerated hernias that are causing the obstruction. So on examination of our patient, he's afebrile and hemodynamically stable. He has a soft distended abdomen. Uh, he has no focal tenderness and no guarding, no signs of peritonitis and the abdomen is tympanic on percussion. percussion. On your PR exam, you uh, identify an empty rectum and no masses are felt and you don't see any blood on your blood. Right, so keep the case at the back of your mind and let's just run through a little bit of the anatomy of the large bowel. And now we're on to our first question. So some of you have already answered, that's great. So what's the most common site of obstruction due to colorectal cancer is the question. At the top of the slide, you can see the, um, the link to the, um, to the question if you haven't, if you didn't catch it at the start, so that's polev.com slash mindthebleep519. 
I'm just gonna leave that out for a little bit longer. And the op options for answers are either left-sided tumors or right-sided tumors. And at the moment, as you can see, majority are answering left-sided tumors. Okay, I think we're giving everyone enough time to answer and we'll move on to um, the anatomy and uh, the answer to this question eventually. So the large intestine is the part of the bowel that stretches from the cecum to the anus. So from the cecum, we go up to the ascending colon to the hepatic flexure, the transverse colon, the splenic flexure, the descending colon, sigmoid colon, and finally the rectum down to the anus. So the bowel wall, it's important to know just very basically about the, the bowel wall and different structures of the, of the bowel wall to understand the pathophysiology of colorectal cancer. So the innermost lining is a layer of epithelial cells, the mucosa, um, they have goblet cells which secrete a lot of mucus um, and help soften stool. Under this we have the submucosa and then the muscularis propria which is um, your uh, muscles that um, help move the stool down the colon. So that's quite a simple um, histological picture of the bowel wall but we'll come back to it when we talk about the pathophysiology as well. Then touching on the arterial supply of the colon, um, the large bowel is uh, supplied by the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery. Um, a bit tedious to learn all of the arteries, but it can be important to understand uh, the surgeries for the different sites of um, colorectal of colectomies, of the excisions of different parts of the colon. So the cecum and the ascending colon are um, supply, supplied by the iliocolic artery. The ascending colon is supplied by the right colic artery and the transverse colon by the middle colic artery, particularly the right branch of the, the sorry, the left branch of the middle colic artery supplies the sp splenic flexure. Then we have the IMA, which supplies the left side of the large colon. Um, this is the uh, transverse and descending colon is supplied by the left colic artery and the sigmoid colon by the sigmoid arteries. Nice and easy there. The rectum is supplied by the middle rectal arteries and the inferior rectal arteries. We'll come back to that when we talk about the surgeries for uh, the different areas of tumors. Venous drainage is also important in the setting of colorectal cancer. Um, and this is particularly due to, uh, to the understanding of where the cancer is spread. So the superior mesenteric vein and the inferior mesenteric vein drain the right and left side respectively of the bowel. These drain up to the portal vein which go to the liver and the liver further drains the blood to the IVC, the right atrium and to the pulmonary arteries. The important, the reason for, for understanding this is because the most common sites of metastasis from the large bowel is the liver and the lung and that makes it quite um, logical. Right, so colorectal cancer, um, it is the third most common cancer in, in the Western world. It, at the, currently, it has an equal male and female uh, predominance. Usually it was seen as a, a male predominant cancer, but in recent years, uh, it's about equal. And this is likely due to uh, women drinking as much alcohol as men and also smoking being more prevalent in women. Um, and um, sort of lifestyle factors being more similar between men and women. Uh, men, however, do experience slightly more rectal cancers than women do. Um, it's most common in the uh, ages of 60 to 70 years old, but we are seeing younger patients 
uh, with colorectal cancer and it's not completely understood why that is. Um, potentially due to, some theories say it's due to increased amount of protein, um, but that's still to be discovered. It is uh, one of the biggest causes of cancer deaths in the Western world as well. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we have implemented a screening program for colorectal cancer. So the reported incident, incidence in patients aged 40 and younger is as little as two to four percent. So where do these cancers mainly occur? Um, as you can see, the sigmoid and rectum have um, the highest rates of colorectal cancers. And this is the left side of the bowel is where we mainly see them. Um, otherwise, we see cancers in the cecum, very rarely um, in the other parts of the bowel. So colorectal cancers start as polyps, start as adenomas, and they follow the usual adenoma carcinoma sequence. So the main mutation that is involved in the pathogenesis of colorectal cancer is the mutation of the APC gene. So this is the tumor suppressor gene called adenomatous polyposis coli. Um, a mutation of this gene causes deregulation of a protein called beta catalin. This protein accumulates in the cells and causes excessive proliferation of the bowel mucosa of the epithelial cells and uh, thereby creating carcinomas of adenomas. So more than 90% of colorectal cancers are adenocarcinomas. We do see some squamous carcinomas as well, especially of the um, rectum and the anus. So there's an, a bit of a different in morphology of the right-sided and left-sided cancers. Right-sided cancers are what we usually call exophytic. This means that they grow outwards in one direction and usually um, out um, and not through the bowel wall or bowel lumen. The left-sided cancers, on the other hand, are often circumferential. As you can see in this photo here, um, this causes a much higher rate of obstruction in left-sided cancers than right-sided cancers is an answer to the first question. So partly this is due to um, the circumferential nature of left-sided cancers. Um, additionally, um, the calibre of stool in the, on the left side is a lot harder, whereas on the right side it's a lot more watery, which allows for the passing of bowel motions more readily on the right side than on the left side. So this is just an important, um, important concept to understand because it does mean that left-sided cancers present with obstructions and often also present much earlier than right-sided cancers because they create an obstruction uh, much earlier. An obstruction in a right-sided cancer often means that the cancer is quite advanced and can have um, associated metastases as well. So these polyps um, have uh, degrees of malignant potential, which is classified by three sort of criteria. So the de degree of dysplasia is identified by histology. Then it's the type of polyp. Um, this is a little bit niche and it's not necessarily relevant for you, but there are three types of polyps. There are the tubular, tubovillus or villus. Um, so on a histology report, you might see that a polyp is villus, which means it has a higher risk of cancer. The size of polyp is also important. Anything below one centimetre has a very small risk of cancer, but anything above two centimetres suddenly has 50% risk of cancer. And that's why usually we remove any polyps um, greater than 0.5 centimetres as the risk increases so drastically with only a small uh, amount of growth. Right, so back to our um, question, 83% of you answered left-sided tumours and this is correct, so well done. Left-sided tumours often um, present with obstruction, whether, whereas right-sided tumours will, will be a very late sign. So let's touch a bit more on clinical features of colorectal cancer. So as mentioned, left-sided cancers present with early obstruction. Due to them being further down in the colon, the descending colon and sigmoid, they often present with fresh rectal bleeding. This can be bright red. If it's a little bit further up in the transverse of the uh, sort of close to the splenic flexure, it might be mixed in with the stool. Due to the cancers being a proliferation of epithelial cells with 
goblet cells secreting mucus, they might um, experience a lot of mucus discharge, and then tenazimus, as explained previously. And constipation is a very common early sign of, of left-sided colorectal cancer. As the bowel um, wall sort of tries to move the, the feces down, down the bowel um, and it's obstructed, they'll also experience a colicky abdominal pain. And they might, you might feel an abdominal mass on the left side as well if the tumour is large enough. Right-sided tumours, on the other hand, um, often patients experience anemia, uh, especially with cecal tumours. Um, they might experience weight loss, and this is sort of a late, quite a late sign in colorectal cancer, and it means that um, the cancer might have spread to adjacent tissues or um, distant metastases. Um, as it is further um, up the, the colon, they might present with diarrhea as opposed to constipation on left-sided tumours. So that's why it's important to, um, to investigate anyone with new changes in bowel habit, whether it's constipation or diarrhea. And on the right side, you might also be able to feel a cecal mass or an abdominal mass on the right side of the abdomen. Right, so we have another question. Um, Bear with me one second. So the next question is, the risk factors for anal squamous cell carcinoma include HPV infection, HSV infection, other genital cancers. There's only one correct answer here. So <clears throat> we'll let you answer the questions while we go through some more of the um, information and we'll come back to the answers later. So going through some of the risk factors for colorectal cancer. So we have inherited and modifiable risk factors. Of the inherited risk factors, we see genetic syndromes. Um, they usually, um, uh, they're, they're usually about 5%, um, 5 to 10% of colorectal cancer. It's quite, quite a small percent um, as opposed to the uh, sporadic and familial causes. But this includes familial adenomatous polyposis, FAP, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, quite a mouthful, also known as Lynch syndrome, a bit easier to pronounce. Inflammatory bowel disease, in particular ulcerative colitis, poses a high risk of colorectal cancer. And acromegaly patients will have um, regular colonoscopies to investigate uh, for colorectal cancer as well. Family history, so this excludes anyone with any of the genetic syndromes. So if you have one degree relative of colorectal cancer, your risk is threefold to the normal population and two first degree relatives, your risk is tenfold. And as you can see, patients with a family history have about 20, or com compose about 25% of all cases of colorectal cancer. Ethnicity, ethnicity was a plays a role, so Ashkenazi Jews have a higher risk of APC gene mutation as well. The most important uh, risk factors, however, are the modifiable ones, as sporadic cancers are a lot more common than, uh, than uh, inherited mutations. The main risk factor, uh, or the main risk factors, are diets high in fat and cholesterol, especially red meat and animal sourced diets. Obesity, so that uh, you have a 30% increase in risk of colorectal cancer compared to the general population if your BMI is higher than 30. Alcohol, 40% um, increased risk if you drink more than four units per day. And especially if this is combined with smoking, you get an exponential risk of colorectal cancer. And then HPV. So the HPV increases your risk of squamous cell carcinoma of the anus and the rectum, um, not of uh, adenocarcinoma. So that's just important. Um, with the um, vaccination uh, of um, 12 year olds, now we see a lot less HPV related cancers um, of the anus and rectum as well. So back to our question. 80% of you answered HPV infection, and that is correct. HSV infection does not increase your risk of um, SCC of the uh, rectum or anus, and other genital cancers do not have um, any, and you not increase the risk at all. So well done. Okay, so we've spoken a bit about the common sort of insidious symptoms, um, but we can also 
um, so we see a lot of emergency presentations. So about 20% of patients with colorectal cancer will um, present to hospital as emergencies. The main cause of emergency is, um, is bowel obstruction, as we've seen in our case. We also see perforation. This can be secondary to bowel obstruction. Um, and we rarely see hemorrhage. And this is an unusual complication. Um, of colorectal cancer. So obstruction is by far the most common presentation, especially of left-sided tumors. Right, so what investigations do you want to order for your patient who presents with any symptoms of colorectal cancer? So we've got another question. Should be activated now. The question is, which of these patients should be referred via the two-week wait pathway for urgent investigation of bowel cancer? So I know we do have quite a lot of international viewers with us. Um, two-week wait pathway is an, an urgent investigation pathway uh, performed in the UK um, where anyone with a um, risk of cancer, symptoms which pose a risk of cancer, are um, investigated within two weeks. So the options are 25 year old with a change in bowel habits, 38 year old with unexplained rectal bleeding, 58 year old with abdominal pain, or a 41 year old with abdominal pain and unexplained weight loss. So we'll leave you to answer those questions while we go through some of the investigations. And we'll come back to the answers shortly. So your bedside investigations for any surgical patient will always be a baseline ECG. In this day and age, you want to do a lateral flow and a rapid COVID PCR. Um, admitting a patient to the ward without a COVID test is uh, currently a never event and shouldn't happen. Um, but it's also important to make sure that if a patient is scheduled for surgery, that they have a valid COVID test. Um, and this differs from a trust to trust, but usually it's within uh, 48 to 72 hours of the surgery. If the patient is of childbearing age, always, always, always order a urine pregnancy test before you order any investigations, especially the scans. Of your bloods, you want to do your, your standard sets, your full blood count, using these liver function tests, CRP. You want to do a full bone profile with a magnesium, assess for any calcium changes. You always want to do an uh, amylase when anyone presents with abdominal pain and any change in bowel habit. And then do your surgical blood so you group and save and clotting in case they, they'll need surgery. And when it comes to tumour markers, um, CEA is a tumour marker for colorectal cancer. However, this is not a diagnostic test. Um, it has a very poor sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of colorectal cancer. It is, however, used for monitoring the progression of colorectal cancer. So you want a baseline CEA and then um, after surgery or chemotherapy sometimes CEA is used to uh, monitor any um, progression of the disease. <clears throat> so abdominal x-rays um, they have quite a limited use I think there's quite a lot of discrepancy between clinicians as to whether you should order them or not. Um, they are useful in identifying bowel obstruction. However, CTs are a lot more useful in identifying bowel obstruction. Um, if you need an urgent imaging um, and you haven't got a hold of a senior or you need, uh, you're not entirely sure whether this is obstruction or not, an ab abdominal x-ray is probably valid. Um, it can identify the level of obstruction. It can also quite readily identify a volvulus, the classic coffee bean sign seen on uh, abdominal x-ray. And if there's a history of an ingested or inserted foreign body, then um, abdominal x-ray will identify that as well. However, in, especially in our case where we suspect bowel obstruction, which is a medical emergency, you are more likely to be asked to request a CT abdomen. Uh, whether uh, you add in contrast or not depends on the clinical picture uh, and uh, what your seniors prefer. Uh, always make sure you check the patient's renal function as contrast does knock out the kidneys if they already have a poor renal function and make sure they're adequately, adequately hydrated. Um, these patients coming in with obstruction are often um, quite dehydrated and may have electrolyte disturbances 
um, so make sure you, you uh, fluid resuscitate them before any contrast. In a non-acute setting, the gold standard investigation for suspected colorectal cancer is always a colonoscopy. So this is used for both screening and diagnosis. You can take histological samples, and you get a good view of the level of the cancer and the morphological features of the cancer as well. If a cancer is confirmed, you want to order a CT chest abdo pelvis for staging. If a patient isn't suitable for a colonoscopy, um, either due to um, not being able to lie on a certain side um, or um, you th don't think it's quite an invasive procedure and you don't think the patient will be suitable, um, a CT colonography or a barium enema um, or alternatively a flexi sig is also possible. For any suspected rectal or anal disease, it's important to order an MRI. And this is because of the relationship with all the musculature, and in particular the anal sphincter, um, as this will be important in establishing what surgical um, method to, to proceed with for the for rectal and anal tumours. It's not as easy as colectomies because of the surrounding pelvic organs and the musculature. I think damaging the um, anal sphincter is quite uh, debilitating and it also uh, damages the, the opportunities for anastomoses. So this is a bearing study, um, not commonly used anymore as CT has superseded it, but you can see quite a nice picture of um, a, um, a stricture here. So this is called the apple core sign as it looks uh, a bit like an apple core and this is a colorectal tumor causing an obstruction. Whether to use flexi-sig versus colonoscopy. Um, so a flexi-sig obviously only goes up to the splenic flexure so you don't get any views of the transverse colon or the ascending colon. So this can be used um, as screening um, if you, um, for patients with polyposis syndromes, if they need sort of bi-yearly or yearly um, uh, colonoscopies or, or flex, flexi -six, um, it's a lot less invasive than a full colonoscopy and it's a lot more tolerated. So it's mostly used to screen alongside fecal occult blood tests uh, or the FIT test, which is now, we'll speak about that a bit later. Um, and it's because 60% of all cancers are found uh, on, in, the prox um, in the distal bowel on the, on the left side. If you uh, have a patient with any symptoms, however, you always need to order colonoscopy to get the full view of the large bowel. So in terms of two-week rate pathway, who should be investigated urgently? So NICE guideline recommends that patients should be referred for urgent investigation of suspected bowel cancer if they are 40 years or older with unexplained weight loss and abdominal pain, 50 years or older with unexplained rectal bleeding, 60 years or older with iron deficiency anemia or change in bowel habit, or a positive occult blood screening test in any age. So this does not mean that Patients who don't fall into this age category shouldn't be screened, but it does mean that they're not, um, they don't meet the criteria for a two week wait. So coming back to our question, majority has, have answered a 41 year old with abdominal pain and unexplained weight loss. And this is absolutely correct. As we saw from the NICE guidelines and um, anyone above the age of 40 with abdominal pain and unexplained weight loss needs to be investigated urgently for cancer. The 25-year-old with change in bowel habit now obviously needs investigating but not urgently as risk of cancer is quite low and the 38-year-old um, also has quite a low risk. Um, abdominal pain on its own without iron deficiency anemia when you change in bowel habit does not warrant a two-week wait um, pathway of investigation but nevertheless they all need uh, investigation. Okay, so going back to our uh, patient, we've got some results back. He has a hemoglobin of 95 and an MCV of 72, so this means he has a microcytic anemia. His creatinine is a bit high at 135, sodium is fine, but he's a bit hypokalemic um, and his lactate's normal. So he obviously has an impending AKI, um, he has a microcytic anemia and hypokalemia probably due to his vomiting. So vomiting causes a 
hypochloremic, hypokalemic um, picture, um, and this needs to be corrected. So we also went on and ordered an abdominal x-ray. And in this photo, you can see dilated loops of large bowel. So you can see the loss of haustral markings, especially along the transverse colon. Um, and the bowel wall has become sort of um, quite um, soft um, and doesn't have the usual haustral. Um, with abdominal x-rays, um, you can use the rule of thumb 369. So any loops of bowel, uh, any loops of small bowel dilated above three centimeters are usually uh, count as uh, dilated. Anything above six centimeters in the large bowel is dilatation and anything above nine centimeters in the cecum is dilated. But that's quite a rough rule of thumb. So we go on to um, order an urgent CT for our patient. And we can, uh, we've seen here, so you can see on the left side of the screen, the black arrows pointing to a low sigmoid stenosis due to an obstructing tumor. We also see this heterogeneous picture in the uh, liver, um, these hypotenuated circumferential um, spots here in the liver. And this um, sadly means that our patient has a liver metastasis alongside his sigmoid tumor. Right, so going on to the management, we want to split it into management of the acute complications and management um, in the elective setting of colorectal cancer. So going on to management of acute complications, your initial management of our uh, patient with bowel obstruction will be keeping him nil by mouth. You want to place an NG tube as he's vomiting and is in quite a lot of discomfort. This aids in decompressing the bowel and it also relieves nausea and relieves the pain as well. You want to rehydrate him. He obviously has quite a high creatinine and you want to replace his electrolytes as needed. Remember to document a fluid status exam um, and assess whether he um, needs a bolus um, or whether he's overloaded from already having received fluids. You want to give some antiemetics as he's vomiting and try to avoid any pro, uh, prokinetics, so avoid metoclopramide. Safe bets are sort of promethazine, um, potentially cyclosine. Always good to just check that as um, a lot of seniors have um, preferences in both pain relief and antiemetics. Um, and then make sure you alleviate their pain with paracetamol and um, start with, with opioids if they need to as well. And then uh, you want to um, consider inserting a catheter in order to mon monitor their strict fluid balance as they're quite dehydrated. <clears throat> okay, so our patient has an acute complete obstruction and obstipation due to his cancer. So he needs urgent surgical management. So we have two methods um, here. So either we can insert a stent, this isn't particularly commonly used, but it is, it can be used as a bridge to surgery. Um, this allows you to um, prep the surgery a bit more for, for theatre, whether they need nutritional support, um, correct their electrolytes and their fluid status. So this is sometimes opted for. It's also used in palliation if the patient isn't fit for surgery. Um, and then a stent um, is inserted for, um, for sort of comfort. The other option is surgical. So the Hartman's procedure is a, an emergency, usually used in emergency setting. Um, it's, it removes the uh, sigmoid and rectal uh, portion of the colon and uh, the patient ends up with an enclostomy and the rectal stump is tied off and this is called the Hartman's pouch. Um, so this can sometimes be reversed. Um, usually you let the bowel rest about three to six months and then you reverse, um, reverse it and uh, anastomose the um, descending colon and the Hartman's pouch, or it can be left as an enclostomy. So this is a common emergency surgical procedure in any sigmoid obstruction. Okay, so going back to our case again, our poor patient has a complete obstruction due to his metastatic sigmoid cancer. 
He has an endoscopic stent inserted because he has an AKI. He's quite poorly. Um, we don't feel like he's fit for surgery at the moment. Unfortunately, unfortunately shortly out following um, his endoscopic stent, he experienced acute severe abdominal pain and a tense distended abdomen. You again are bold and you order an abdominal x-ray and this is what you get. So above the, uh, below the diaphragm, you can see um, hypoattenuation here. Um, this is gas below the diaphragm on both sides. Um, and this is an indication of pneumoperitoneum um, and a sign of a perforated bowel. So this can occur due to obstruction itself or due to um, iatrogenic causes such as endos endoscopy. Um, and as we saw in our patient, the stent insertion. So this patient has an acute perforation of his bowel. So he therefore goes on to have his emergency Hartman's procedure um, and ends up with an end colostomy. So that's emergency management. It's a bit different from elective management. The aims of elective management is to cure the cancer to remove the tumour with margins around, to remove any surrounding tissues so lymph nodes, vessels affected, and then to optimise bowel function if possible. So colorectal um, or colectomies for colorectal cancer can be either laparoscopic or laparotomy. Um, either they get a primary anastomosis, so a connection of the two ends of the colon during surgery or a defunctioning stoma. So they might get a stoma that is then left to rest and heal for a couple of months before it's re-anastomosed um, after it's, it's um, healed itself. So the, um, the management options depend on the stage of, um, of the tumour. Um, for colorectal cancer, we use the modified Duke staging or the T, the classic TNN staging. Um, the modified Duke staging is classified into A, A to D. So the A, stage A is any tumor that's no deeper than the submucosa. So it's, no, it's not penetrated into the muscularis. The uh, cancer stages B are cancers that have penetrated either into the muscularis or through the muscularis into the um, tissue below, um, but not yet spread um, to the lymph nodes. C is a spread to the lymph nodes and D is distant metastasis. So for our patients with liver mets, um, he's a stage, a Duke stage D colorectal cancer. So for stage A and B, where we don't have any distant, any um, local spread or any distant spread, uh, surgery is the mainstay and try to, um, to reset the diseased part of the colon and anastomose. In stage C, where we have lymph node spread, um, might perform surgery with a adjuvant chemotherapy. And in stage D, um, it's uh, either surgery with um, chemotherapy, potentially radiotherapy, or palliative care, um, and stenting as mentioned before. Right, <clears throat> so just quickly touching on the resection of the proximal, uh, of the resection of the different tumours. So of the proximal tumours, the ascending colon tumours, like the cecal tumours, you perform a right hemicolectomy with an iliotransverse anastomosis. You have to ligate the uh, iliocolic artery and the right branch of the middle colic artery. In the transverse colon, you often will perform an extended right colectomy. So this depends on the involvement of the lymph nodes. And this is due to the needing the, the ligation of the uh, middle colic artery at the stem. You then compromise the vascular supply to the splenic flexion to the entirety of the transverse colon. And you get, the, get this, what's called a watershed area of um, ischemia. Um, and therefore the entire um, right side of the colon may need to be resected. You get an iliodescending anastomosis. Of the splenic flexure and the descending colon, you will uh, perform a left hemicolectomy, where you remove the left colic artery and you get a sigmoid transverse anastomosis. And for the sigmoid colon, you perform a sigmoid colectomy or a high anterior resection, so that involves the rectum, rectum as well, 
you ligate the sigmoid arteries and potentially the middle rectal artery. Rectal tumors are a little bit more complicated. So if they're high lying, about three centimeters higher uh, up from the anal margin, you can perform either a high or low anterior resection. Um, and in these cases, you often um, perform either a primary anastomosis or a defunctioning stoma. Um, because you're removing the rectum, which is sort of a reservoir for um, feces and um, sort of a space where feces can remain until bowels are open, um, you need to often um, create what's called a J pouch where you um, sort of tuck the, um, the colon back on itself and that creates a pouch for that imitates the rectum um, and makes um, bowel motions easier to, to store and pass. For a low lying rectal tumor, um, you often perform an abdominoperineal resection. This is quite a complicated surgery because it requires the resection of the sigmoid colon and the rectum, as well as a rese the resection of the anus. And the resection of the anus is done through the perineum, whereas the sigmoid colon and the rectum is done um, through the, the abdomen. Um, and the patient, because you're removing the anus, the patient then ends up with an enclostomy bag um, and the anus is sewed up. Patient and subtotalectomies are not uh, generally cancer surgeries, but they are often used in high risk groups for prevention of surgery. So, for example, in ulcerative colitis and in polyposis, such as familial adenomatous polyposis. And this, um, obviously, removing the entire large bowel uh, completely obliterates the chance of a colorectal cancer. <clears throat> Right, so we have our next question, which is, what's the most common post-colectomy complication? So we have four options here, paralytic ileus, surgical site infection, anastomotic leaks, and major hemorrhage. Hopefully that is live for you and you are able to comment, uh, to answer that as we go along. So I'm gonna let you answer and we'll get back to the answers shortly. So just touching on operative complications. So we have intraoperative complications, which are your standard um, surgical complications, include bleeding, any uh, reaction from the anesthesia, damage to any adjacent organs, so that will be bowel perforation, damage to the ureters, the bladder, or sexual dysfunction from damage to uh, any of the sexual organs or nerves, um, or subcutaneous uh, emphysema, which is air under the um, under the skin, which is usually self-resolving. What's more important for you as a junior is the post-operative complications. So surgical site infections are very common. This is any infection of the, of the operative site, anastomotic leakage in a, a, a primary anastomosis, intra-abdominal abscesses, and ile paralytic ileus and bleeding are all fairly common complications. Surgical site infections occur around day five to seven postoperatively. Their class is any infection of the wound site within 30 days of surgery. You get the classic signs of infection, so any erythema, classically if it spreads, pain, maybe discharge, and wound dehiscence. It just looks a bit mucky. They might also get a systemic features of infection, tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension, and fevers. Um, we try to prevent surgical site infections with antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, we usually get, give second generation cephalosporins um, with metronidazole, and that's usually given before um, surgery um, and um, after as well, one to three doses. However, patients still get um, infections, especially day five when antibiotics are worn off. So if you, um, if you suspect, if you come across a patient who's had their surgery, their febrile, their wound's a bit, a bit mucky, if you want to order a wound swab, you know, full set of bloods um, and order a blood culture as well. In terms of management, it depends, um, of, depends how, uh, how bad the infection is. If there's an underlying collection, um, the surgeon might opt for drainage, drainage and healing by secondary intention. So do drainage and healing sort of openly and letting the, um, you won't close it up again until it's fully healed. Um, you might treat with antibiotics. Anastomotic leakage, um, 
unfortunately fairly common, um, ranges from sort of five to 20% um, of cases. Um, clinical features you might see are a little bit vague, but you might see a fever around day two. So this occurs um, often sooner than any surgical site infections. You'll see an absence of bowel action. This is an impo important site because paralytic ileus happens um, quite commonly, um, and this usually resolves spontaneously at around day two to three. So if that doesn't resolve, and the patient still hasn't opened their bowels at day four, this is when you should get worried, um, and it might indicate an anastomotic leakage. Uh, any diarrhea before day seven or leukocytosis at around day seven also indicates uh, potential um, anastomotic leakage. And if they have purulent discharge, if they have a drain inserted uh, or any discharge from their rectum, that will also indicate um, a leakage. Um, so management of this is trying to avoid a relaparotomy, um, but you'll usually be asked to order a CT to try and um, investigate what is going on, on underneath the skin um, and the management can range from expectant um, if the leakage is small and uh, drain insertion giving antibiotics prophylactically or, or uh, to manage any peritonitis or relaparotomy if it's a severe leakage. Paralytic ileus is the most common cause uh, most common post-operative uh, complication and it essentially is caused um, by just kind of poking around the bowel and the bowel being a bit, getting a bit paralyzed after surgery. Um, and it usually lasts for about two to three days. Um, and essentially it's the common um, usual symptoms of bowel obstruction. So failure to pass any stool or flatus, uh, bloating and distension, they might vomit um, and they'll have absent bowel sounds as opposed to an obstruction when they will have um, either loud or tinkling bowel sounds. So your management will be keeping the patient nil by mouth, making sure they're hydrated with IV fluids, inserting an NG tube if they're vomiting or in a lot of discomfort, and trying to prevent um, a long-standing ileus by mobilizing the patient and reducing any um, opiates as well. Right, so most of your answers are paralytic ileus, and that is um, absolutely correct, but all of these complications um, are very common. Um, especially uh, surgical site infections and ileus. Right, so quickly on the screening. So in the UK, we offer faecal tests every two years from the age of 60 um, up until 2021. We're now lowering the age until the age of 50 because we're seeing colorectal cancer in the younger patient cohort. We've gone from using GIAC based faecal occult blood tests, which was quite uh, insensitive to faecal immunochemical tests, FIT tests. So this is 97% sensitivity for colon cancer and also differentiates between upper GI bleeding and low GI bleeding. Right, so the next question. Hopefully you can see that. So what condition is this? This is just a quick fire question. You have the options between FAP, Lynch syndrome, or HNPCC, Pitsiaga syndrome, or Gardner syndrome. So I'll let you answer this whilst we quickly run through our last segment, which is colorectal polyps. Polyps are heterogeneous growths in the bowel lumen. They're very common but they do have the potential for malignant change. As we said, all, adeno all carcinomas have been adenomas. So we have different types of um, polyps, not particularly important to know the sort of morphological features, um, but the importance is knowing the difference between normal neoplastic uh, polyps, inflammatory polyps caused by UC. So you get these pseudo polyps, hematomatous polyps caused by Pozziagas, and hyperplastic polyps, which are com completely benign. Quickly on FAP. So this causes 1% of colorectal cancers. It's a genetic disease with autosomal dominant inheritance um, causing a mutation in the APC gene. So as mentioned, this is a tumor suppressor gene um, and the mutation causes excessive proliferation of epithelial cells. And as you can see from this photo, they get hundreds of adenomatous polyps. 
they're usually asymptomatic. They might notice a, a slight rectal bleeding or abdominal pain. Um, but usually the first presentation is colorectal cancer and almost all patients will develop cancer by the age of 40. And due to this, they will have a flexi sig for screening every one to two years, starting at the age of 10 to 12, to document the onset of polyposis. And therefore, because most cancers um, occur about 10 years after um, the onset of poly polyposis, you can then start planning a colectomy to prevent cancer. And that will usually be in the patient's uh, mid 20s. Hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, HNPCC or Lynch syndrome, um, is also autosomal dominant inheritance. It has a lifetime risk of cancer of 85%, and that includes several other cancers like endometrial, TCC, and gastric cancers. Um, it's mostly a clinical diagnosis, uh, looking at the patient's family tree. So if they have three or more relatives with colorectal cancer, over two generations, they're generally classed as um, being at higher risk of having Lynch syndrome. You can also get genetic testing today. Mean age of diagnosis of cancer is 45, um, and colonoscopy is therefore um, used as a screening tool from the age of 20, um, and it's every two years. And these patients usually have a colectomy before the onset of cancer, which is um, generally in their 20s as well. It's similar to FAP. So going back to this picture, 86% of you have answered post jaeger syndrome, and this is correct. So you get telangiectasia and buccal hyperpigmentation. So this is again an autosomal, autosomal dominant condition. It causes multiple um, hematomas, usually involving the small intestine, but can uh, involve the large intestine as well. Um, causes uh, mucocutaneous hyperpigmentations of the nose, um, of the mucosa, hands, feet, and genitalia. So it's quite a common exam question um, as the, uh, the signs are quite evident. The risk of bowel cancer is 39% uh, lifetime risk. They have a massively high risk of bowel cancer as well, and therefore they're also screened with regular colonoscopies. Okay, so our last question. Which of the following statements are true with regard to colorectal cancer? Almost 50% occur in the rectosigmoid region. Reduced dietary fiber is associated with an increased risk. 20% as an emergency uh, presentation or with intestinal obstruction or all of the above. You might not see the 20% as the third option there, but that says 20% uh, present as an emergency with intestinal obstruction. I'll just give you a couple of moments to answer that while we go through the summary. So colorectal cancer mostly presents with um, PR bleeding, anemia, constipation, and in the emergency setting as a complete obstruction. Um, Remember the difference between right-sided and left-sided tumours. Uh, any iron deficiency anemia is colorectal cancer until proven otherwise in the elderly. Colonoscopy is the gold standard investigation, but it's contraindicated in complete constipation. We currently in the UK screen from the age of 50 as of this year with the FIT test. Um, and um, they have had a few um, sort of trials with a one-off colonoscopy as well, but this is still in progress and being discussed, the um, cost efficiency of this. And remember that we have a few polyposis syndromes and these pose a high risk of colorectal cancer, including FAP and Lynch syndrome and Fitzjagger's syndrome causing hematomas. Right, so final question. Which of the following statements are true? And the correct answer is all of the above, and it's just highlighting um, some of the points we've spoken about. So very good, 85% of you answered. Fantastic. So that concludes our um, presentation. Apologies for going five minutes over. Um, just want to remind you that we have weekly webinars with Mind the Bleep. So go on to mindthebleep.com and follow, um, follow them. They have a lot other 
lot of other very useful articles and presentations. So our surgical series will continue next Monday at the same time, eight, eight o'clock um, UK time. And I'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, hopefully the camera isn't in the way. Um, if you have any questions, please email us or um, write in the uh, comment section below. Um, and please give us feedback, it's really useful. And please let us know if the polls and the questions work for you as well, it'll be very useful. Thank you so much for following uh, this presentation. I'll leave the, the QR code up. Um, sorry, there we go. I'll leave the QR code up for a little while longer so um, you can um, give us feedback. Be very grateful.